Good morning. Welcome to Orchard Park Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here. I invite you to gather together, quiet your minds, open your hearts, and worship God.
We continue to believe that we need to earn our way into God's love and grace. But God's grace is given to each of us unconditionally, freely, and always. Let us open our lives to God's mercy. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. It seems we cannot decide, holy God. We say we live to serve others, but end up meeting our needs and wants first. We claim to live in a way that honors Christ, but we hesitate to share him with those we know in work, school, and socially. We believe that the gospel can transform lives the lives of others in need. But we fail to acknowledge that we also need transformation. Forgive us, God of peace. May we carry compassion to the hurting. Instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, may we be workers with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to reach out and bring the kingdom of God to everyone we meet. Amen. This is the good news. In God's kingdom, there is no ranking. God graces everyone with God's gifts, the gifts of mercy, 
restoration, new life. God has kept the covenant, and in God we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Please greet those around you with Christ's peace. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Oh 
Hi. How are you? I'm glad you could come worship with us today. You'll have to excuse me. I was so hungry, I was eating some spaghetti and meatballs. Do you like spaghetti and meatballs? I love spaghetti and meatballs. You know, there's a story. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. It's a really funny story, and you may have seen the movie also. But it's about this community that has a machine that all they ask for, they just ask for food, and the food falls from the sky, and they get any request they want. So they can have a, they can ask for spaghetti and meatballs, or they can ask for pizza, and all of a sudden the food just shows up, whatever they want. You know, sometimes we can take for granted, do you know what that means? It means we can not really appreciate, we cannot be grateful for the food that we have in our house. How many of you, when you go to your refrigerator, open your refrigerator and see food in your refrigerator? Or open a cabinet and see food just there? Maybe sometimes you go to the grocery store and you see all the food in the grocery store and you're able to even pick out what you want to eat. There are many, many children in our country and in our town and in our world who do not have access to food and water. They are not able to simply go to their cabinets and pull food out. And so I wonder if we could think together about a way that we could be thankful for the food we eat and to not waste it and to respect it to not throw it away, and to not eat too quickly, but to really recognize and remember where it came from, who provided it, and what it will do for you. It'll help you grow. It'll help you think. It will make you strong. And ultimately, all of those things come from God, who gives you everything you need every day day. So I invite you to slow down when you eat. Think about what you're eating. Not be wasteful. And thank God for the gifts you have been given. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the food we have eaten and for those who provide it and those who serve it. Help us to serve those others who are not able to have the food that they need. And let us all serve those who are hungry. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, the 16th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Hear the word of God to you today. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, 
In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. As Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the bread of life. And you give us what we need. You sustain us with your grace. And you provide for us what we need every day. Help us to trust in you. Help us to trust in your provisions. And help us to lean into your word. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. There is a line in The Wizard of Oz that I always remember. Dorothy has survived a tornado. She's been taken for a ride in a cyclone. She's landed in a foreign country. She's met a new culture of people called munchkins. She's been accused of murder and thievery of ruby slippers. And she's been told that in order to get home safely, she will need to go on a journey. And on that journey, she meets a scarecrow who is seeking intelligence. And a tin man who desires a heart. And at this point in the movie, she has been attacked by some apple trees. And she then invites the tin man to join them. And she says, we can't stop now. We have come such a long way already. Suddenly there's this cloud of smoke in the background. And the wicked witch pops up as if she's been eavesdropping on this conversation the whole time. And she startles them and she says, you call that long? Why, you've just begun. I've always wondered how the Wicked Witch knew that. How does she know that Dorothy has such a long trip ahead? Does she have a map of the yellow brick road? How did Dorothy feel when she heard that her journey had just begun? When the Israelites leave Egypt for the promised land, they have been on this journey as we get to this story for two months. They have left the only culture they have ever known and a lifetime of slavery. They put their children on their backs and they carry everything they own and they leave civilization for the wilderness. They are not in Kansas anymore. The landscape looks entirely different than the land that they came from. There is nothing out there. It is bleak and the elements are perilous. And they start taking stock in their resources. And there is no going back. 
But they start to anticipate that they are going to run out of food. They do the calculus and they realize that it's not going to take long until they will die from starvation. So they start anticipating their demise and they get really anxious. And they say to Moses and Aaron, you brought us out here to die. Now they have only been on this journey for two months and we know that they are going to be on this journey for 40 years. They think this is long why they've just begun. There's no going back for Dorothy. She can't turn around. She has to keep going and learn something along the way. There's no going back for the Israelites. The only way to go is forward. And it is at this moment of reality that makes them pause and take a collective breath and ask, just what have we gotten ourselves into? And they get anxious and they get afraid and they get angry and they ask, how are we going to eat? And God hears this cry and he tells Moses he has a plan. He says every morning little flakes of bread or manna will fall from the sky and coat the ground. And every evening quails will fall from the sky and provide meat. And they need to take only what they need and not, they will not be able to consume serve anything for the next day. They will need to trust that every day God will give them just what they need to survive and not one person will have any more than any other person. On Friday, a double amount of the manna will fall so that on Sabbath, they will not have to toil, but be able to take Sabbath and dedicate the day to worshiping God. And so begins a routine of walking, manna for breakfast, quail for dinner, worship on Saturdays, and a new normal sets in. And they keep going day in, day out for 40 years. It will be a lifetime for many. Most will never live to see the end of the journey. Many will spend their entire lives on the road. The hours turn into days, and the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and the months turn into years, and every day, every day, they are given enough to get through. There is this pentanal prayer that is offered in Jewish homes at the start of every Sabbath. It says, days pass and years vanish and we walk sightless among miracles. What is the miracle in this story, do you think? Is the miracle that God heard the complaining of hungry people and fed them with food that they would never have thought to eat? Or, put it another way, is the miracle the substance itself or our ability to recognize the one who provides it for us? Barbara Brown Taylor suggests how you answer those questions has a lot to do with how you sense God's presence in your life. If your manna has to drop straight out of heaven, looking like a perfect loaf of butter-crusted bread, then chances are you are going to be hungry a lot. When you do not, do not get the miracle you are praying for, you are going to think that God is ignoring you or punishing you, or worse yet, that God is not there. You are going to start comparing yourself to the other people around you and wondering why they seem to get more to eat than you. And you may even start complaining to heaven about that. Meanwhile, you are going to miss a lot of other things God is doing for you because they are hidden in the ordinary. But if on the other hand... You are willing to look at everything that comes to you as coming from God. 
then there will be no end of manna in your life. A can of beans will be manna. Bug juice will be manna. Nothing will be too ordinary to remind you of God. Now, Moses does something brilliant, I think, in this story. He doesn't take ownership of anything. He just serves God and serves the people. He stays the course. He says to the people, if you have a complaint, it's not about me. You take it to God. And if you are grateful for the gifts of what you have, you take your gratitude to God. God is the one who deserves the glory, and God is the one to whom you should lodge your complaint. So friends, here's the situation. We are not in Kansas anymore. And we think we've come a long way during this time of pandemic, civil unrest, and climate change. But I think we have only just begun. And here's the biggest truth of all. We cannot go back. During the early days of the 2020 pandemic, folks fantasized about what they'd do after this was all over. Sit beers in the bars, get pedicures, hug their grandparents. Now you can do all of that, sort of. And many of us are wondering if we should and if it's safe. We're in this strange post-COVID generation with post-COVID brains. There's been another seismic shift recently, one that has to do with police brutality. We've seen the videos of George Floyd and Jacob Blake and children being maced and the mayor of Portland being tear gassed and Navy vets being beaten. And regardless of how you feel about those incidents, we cannot unsee those sights. Even if you don't want to, those experiences have changed things, and they have changed us. Columnist Georgia Garvey tells this story. She says, one day I was visiting my grandmother in Greece in the 1990s, and I moved some clothes in a dresser to make room for my stuff, and pressed into the back of the drawer were socks and jewelry and rolls of money stuffed inside. What are these, Yaya? I asked, holding the heavy socks out. She gave me a cold stare and plucked them from my hand. It was a habit she had picked up, my father told me. During the Italian and German occupation of Greece during World War II, she'd hidden what she had so they wouldn't be stolen, so they didn't starve during the famines. But it's been 50 years, I thought to myself, not understanding that though there may not have been Nazis around, she would always be a woman who had her things stolen by them. In the same way, I cannot help but think of how our children will forever be impacted by the images they see on their devices and images on the news by the wearing of masks and the fear of disease. Still others will be impacted and will be forever impacted by escaping fires and hurricanes. Someday their grandchildren will find a remnant of this time in the wilderness and they will try to understand how they were changed and just why they act that way. Like it or not, we will always be the 2020 generation. We will always be the ones who have seen these things, who have borne witness to these things, who have done these things, and we will be changed by this time. For better or for worse, that remains for us to choose. Will we emerge stronger or weaker Will we be able to discover inside ourselves sympathy for our fellow man? Or will we merely scale new heights of cruelty? 
Maybe we'll have to wait and see. Or maybe we'll need to work to make our transformation a positive one. Maybe. 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 So what do we do out here in this wilderness? Well, we can complain. We can blame. We can defend. We can stick our heels in the ground and scrounge for as much resources or toilet paper as we can possibly store up. We can do all of those things and we can see where it takes us. We can also choose to look for the miracles that are given to us every day. Trusting that every day we are given a miracle. The juicy sweetness of a peach, the bright red turning of a leaf, the out of the blue call of a friend, the laughter that comes from deep down, the empathy we have for a stranger. These are miracles that happen to us every day, every day every day. We can also decide to learn something. At the end of Wizard of Oz, after that long harrowing adventure, it all comes down to the last question. Dorothy, what have you learned? Dorothy says, well, I think that it wasn't enough to just want to see Uncle Henry and Auntie M, and that it's, if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there, I never really lost it to begin with. After 40 years in the wilderness, the Israelites will get to the promised land. And Moses will preach his final sermon. And he will proclaim what they have surely learned. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations, Surely they learned that. And centuries later, Paul, who was on another kind of journey and another kind of road, and says what he learned through his trials, he will say, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look for miracles. Decide what it is you need to learn. And sing together. Pilgrim through this barren land. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer together this morning, let us remember all those in our church family with ongoing needs and concerns. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Holy God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You call us to extend your love to the world around us, to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. 
And so we bring the needs of our world before you now. We pray for those who do not have what they need in order to survive, those without enough food to eat or shelter to keep them safe, those without employment or enough money to pay their bills, those without access to medical care or medicine to keep them healthy. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have more than enough to meet their needs, but who continue to feel empty inside, who struggle to find the meaning and purpose in life. Those who turn to alcohol, drugs, or other destructive behaviors to try and hide the pain. Those who entertain thoughts of suicide. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling physically, those who are battling life-threatening disease or injury, those who are living with chronic pain, those coping with Alzheimer's or facing death. Lord, hear our prayer. God of the first and the last, and all those in between. Your grace reaches out to all of us, lifelong believers and newcomers alike. You call us to live as citizens of heaven, to work together with one mind and one purpose, to reach out in love to those in need. Strengthen us so that we might live in a manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives to the building up of your kingdom where there is grace enough for all. These things we pray in the name of our Savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and those who live in it. With joyful hearts, let us return to God our tithes and offerings.
in peace. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sustain you with the bread of heaven and the gift of life and the miracle of the day, this day and always. Amen. Thank you.